Good morning. Uh, my name is Douglas Griffin, and I am teaching from the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 21. We've been going through it for at least a year now, uh, verse by verse. We think uh, that it's easier to understand the meaning if you just take your time and go verse by verse to get it in context. So some people are nice enough to kind of take this journey with me. They've been with me since Exodus. Um, in J Exodus chapter 21, Moses has, under God's direction, brought the children of Israel to Mount Sinai, where he is now making his covenant with them. Uh, it's been 400 years since God made the, the initial covenant with Abraham. And uh, they've spent hundreds of years in Egypt. And now God has delivered them from Egypt, and he has to retrain them. It's a retraining that's going on as to who he is, what is right, and what is wrong. Uh, when God started over with Noah and his three sons, he laid down some laws like, do not murder. Um, and then those three sons spread out. Ham went south through the Middle East, down. In, uh, we think that the Ark landed somewhere like in Turkey. Um, in the Mount Ararat area, Ham went down Middle East. Uh, Sham, he went south, I mean, Middle East, Africa. Sham went toward China and India on, and Japheth went towards Europe. Anyway, they spread out. They took with them some laws, like thou shalt not murder and pass it unto those civilizations, but... <clears throat> Uh, each of those civilizations began to stray, obviously, and make up their own rules and worship go other gods and create other uh, forms of worship and moral and ethic systems. So God is retraining the, the Israelites who've been in Egypt. He, he's saying, here's what I'm saying is right and wrong. I created the universe. Here's how it works. So um, I'm going to start where we ended off last week. Uh, in Exodus chapter 21, well, actually, this is, um, we gave an example last week of Joab. Uh, well, I'm sorry, let me just read the verses that I'm trying to illustrate. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 12, God says, He who strikes a man so that he dies, so surely be put to death. Again, this is assuming it's not an accident. Assuming he meditated, I'm taking the law into my own hand and I'm killing this person. So God is saying, you don't have the right to do that. You didn't give that person life. You don't have the right to be their executioner and their judge. Without a trial, you just decide right and wrong. Um, but God understands there can be... So, so he creates this consequences, this consequence in order to deter. Sometimes we need consequences to deter us. Uh, you can put up a sign that says, please only drive 10 miles an hour in this school zone. If there are little kids crossing the street. You can put up a sign that says that, so, but people sometimes think, yeah, but I've got to get to that luncheon, so I'm going to go 50. Uh, and so... There has to be consequences sometimes to deter people from doing things. So he says, he who strikes a man so he dies, so should be put to death. So just know that you will lose your life if you take someone else's life. So hopefully the, the, the threat of that will deter some people. But he knows it won't deter everybody because people are just crazy. Now he says, however, in verse 13, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hands. Meaning, uh, God allowed a certain situation. God doesn't say, here, kill this person. But he, he, it just means if, and he gives an example later on of you're chopping and your axe handle flies off and hits somebody. That's a situation that God allowed. He didn't strike you down with lightning before you did it. I'm going to kill you because you're about to accidentally kill somebody else. So if God allowed the situation, um, he says, then I will point for you a place where, you, where he may flee. 
because as far as the family is concerned, you still killed Uncle Benny. So they're going to come after you. But if you know that it was an accident, then there's a place you can go where you can flee. And then when the Avengers come, then there has to be a trial so that you can prove your point. Uh, this, these are all new. There are other cultures that they've studied around this time. And they just said, murder is murder and you're dead. Um, but God is trying to create this. He's not trying. He's creating and instituting this system because he knows that there are consequences. It gets very specific. Um, however, God's not dumb in that he knows that some people will do something on purpose and then go to the place where they can flee and try to plead their case. And, no, I was innocent, but you weren't. So God knows you may kill somebody on purpose. Sometimes it could be an accident. Sometimes you'll pretend it's an accident. So in verse 14, it says, but if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar, because that's one of the places he was able to go. Take him from my altar. Take him out of the temple, because that was, again, a place of refuge. We, we still have that today. There are churches that uh, immigrants might go to or, or somebody to, you know, I'm claiming refuge. Right? So we still have that way of thinking. Uh, but you take him from my altar that he may die. Um, so I gave an example last week. Of, and it was, we talked about Joab. Joab killed a couple of his cousins. Uh, he killed the general of an army. He, he just took vengeance into his own hand using the cover of war, using an excuse, but really it was just murdering people and then pretending like, oh, well, I had to do that. He attacked me or I had to do that because. Uh, but in reality, uh, he was just a murderous person who should not have been in that position. So he goes to the altar and he grabs onto the altar. Uh, now that he knows he's in trouble, that he's been found out. And in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 30, Benaniah, who has been sent by Solomon, Benaniah is, goes to get him from the altar. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 30, So Benaniah went to the tabernacle of the Lord, this is where we ended last week, and said to him, Thus says the king, come out. Like, just, I know that God created this place of refuge, but you are abusing it. And he said, Nope, I will die here. I'm just going to stand here on the altar for the next 20 years. So there. And Ben and I brought back word to the king saying, thus says Joab, and thus he answered me. So the writer doesn't repeat the whole thing. He just says, thus he said, and thus he answered me. And the king says to him, well, do as he has said, and strike him down and bury him. He said, I'll die there. Let him die there in the altar, which is, God didn't, he says, take him from the altar. He said, well, we, what can we do? We, He's at the altar. We can't. So Solomon's like, I'm not dumb. Uh, just because God didn't write every little wrinkle in. And if he's wearing a blue shirt, you know, God couldn't. <laughs> the Bible would be 59,000 pages long if God wrote every single wrinkle that somebody. So he puts principles down. Every single thing that God, somebody might try. So uh, it says, uh, you can't just go to the altar and stay there till you die. So do as he said, strike him down, bury him that you may take away from me and from the house of my father the innocent blood with Joab shed. Because he killed David's nephews, he, he killed David's friends, David had been previously been king. So, verse 32, so the Lord will return his blood on his head, meaning what you did comes back on you. God invented the law of sowing and reaping. He made it a law. If you sow kindness, you will get kindness back. If you sow anger, and you'll get anger back in your life. Now, it doesn't mean that every single time somebody yelled at you, that's because you yelled at somebody 20 years ago. But, because uh, there's just some crazy people who are just going to yell at you or something. <laughs> you, know, you might be getting shot at on the freeway. Uh, that doesn't mean you shot somebody. But just in general, what you put out comes back to you. And so um, he says, 
and the, his blood is on his head. The Lord's going to return his blood. The blood that he shed, his blood now has to be shed. Uh, because he struck down two men more righteous and better than he. And I explained that I had to go through this whole thing because of Joshua Shaw, who's uh, like, what do you mean he's more righteous? Uh, but in, in his case, he's saying these men uh, didn't do anything, and yet he struck them down. All that Abner did was get re was replace him. Once David found out that Joab was a crazy person, he replaced him. And that's why he was killed. So this is, you know, he's acting as though I'm avenging righteous blood. And the other gentleman, um, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Abner was the general for the other side who warned uh, Joab's brother Stop following me. I don't want to have to kill you. Stop following me. Quit it. Stop it. Stop. And he wouldn't. He said, well, you, I can't let you just come up and strike me and kill me. So I'm telling you stop because if I turn around, I'm bigger than you. I'm showing you. I'm going to. So stop coming after me. You're chasing me. Everybody, your rest of your army is 100 yards away. They've let go. You're all by yourself chasing me and I'm bigger than you. Stop it. Nah, not going to stop it. So he killed him. Uh, but it was uh, Amasa that replaced Joab. And then Joab got upset and killed him. So he killed them with the sword. Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of the army of Israel. That means the northern army. And Amasa, the son of Jether, the commander of the army of Judah, the southern army. Though my father David did not totally understand everything that happened. It did not know it, did not tell him to do it. Their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and on the head of his descendants forever. Now this is Solomon talking. This is not God saying, well, if your grandfather did something, you know, for the next forever, your kids are just going to be. This is Solomon talking uh, because that's just how they spoke. The, the, because he's saying the repercussions of his actions, the repercussions of it not the um not god cursing his kids but if you're if a parent does a horrible thing and gets arrested and goes to jail the repercussions of that actions affect the kids and this kids kids because now you got a parent that's in jail or something and you you know so but it doesn't mean that you're now cursed to go to jail so he's saying the repercussions are going to be on his house this he his family will be famous for being known as uh, like the John Wilkes Booth's grandkids. Oh, John Wilkes Booth was your, you, he shot Lincoln. He was your granddaddy. It's just on your kids and your kids' kids and your kids' kids. So, uh, and there shall be no peace forever from, from the Lord. So Benaniah, the son of Jehovah, went up and struck and killed him at the altar. And he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. Even though God said, don't kill him at the altar. This was a situation where if we let this person just live at the altar for the next 20 years, people are coming to make sacrifices. The priests are coming to do to shed blood for the sins of the people. And there is uh, Joab just standing there for 20 years. Hi, how are you? I'm just standing here at the altar. Uh, that's going to look bad. Oh, I can do things and as long as I go stand at the altar, I have to stand next to Joab. So I'm going to kill my mother-in-law and then I'm going to go stand at the altar. So, uh, he says, so common sense, right? Even though God said, don't do it at the altar, he didn't write. But if they go to the altar and stand there for 20 years, because then he'd be saying, but because then God would have to cover every single thing. So some things he trusts us to use common sense, right? So the king put... Benaniah, uh, he, uh, the son of Jehovah, in his place made, now you'll be king, over the army and put Zadok the priest in the place of Abiathar because Abiathar also was a conspirator with Joab. Now, I want to tell you the final story about how this, these things were played out because here's, a, here's the law that was initially given 
and here's how it was carried out later. Um, I'm going to talk about Athalia, this, the Queen Athalia. She's actually the daughter of Jezebel, and Jezebel's very famous, right? Ahab and Jezebel, uh, if they'd had a re reality show, it got big ratings because they were crazy, and people like to watch blood and craziness. Mm -hmm. And they were killing people left and right, killing all the prophets of God because they wanted to erect their own idols, do their own thing. So, um, Athaliah is their daughter. <sighs> so, Ahazia, this is Athaliah's son. Ahazia was 22 years old when he be, oh, I'm sorry, where am I reading from? 2 Kings chapter 8, 2 Kings chapter 8, in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 26. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. He was only <laughs> king for one year. Let me tell you what happened. It says his mother's name was Athaliah, and she's the granddaughter of Omri, king of Israel, and it doesn't say so, but the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So they're, they're kings in the north, Ahab and Jezebel. Ahaziah is king in the, in the south. He's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be the line of David, but this is the line of Ahab. So uh, Ahab's, he becomes Ahab's grandson-in-law um, because Athaliah, his mother, had a daughter who married Ahazia, all these names, and, now, and they were appointed king in the south. Should not have been king in the south. Should have been somebody from the line of David. And so God's going to fix that. People get in positions for a while and we get all panicked and paranoid. And, ah, but God sees what's going on. He, gives, he always gives people a chance to repent. He doesn't give someone a heart attack instantly and strike them down. He gives them opportunity to repent because that's what he wants. But if they just are going to get worse and worse and worse, then he removes them from that situation. <coughs> so uh, <clears throat> verse 27 says he walked in the way of the house of Ahab. That's his grandfather-in-law up north and did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. He is Athaliah's son-in-law, Athaliah's Ahab's daughter. And this is about her. We'll see how it's about her in a, in, a, in a minute. Now, he went with Joram, the son of Ahab. So Athaliah married Joram. And they are now, Joram's the king up north because Ahab and Jezebel have been taken care of. They're out of the picture now. So Joram uh, is king up north. Ahab, and that's Athaliah's brother. So Joram's king up north. Athaliah's the, the sister. And she has a, a daughter who marries ah Ahaziah, and they're down south. Okay, so his father-in-law is king up north. He's down south. So he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Haziel, king of Syria. And yes, all these names sound alike. So do ours. LeMichael and LeDavid and LeJohn. <laughs> okay, LaKeisha and Le LaTwita. And... Anyway, so he went to war against Haziel, king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram. So they wounded the king up north. Joram's the king up north. Ataliah, his sister. He had a daughter who married Ahazia. So they wounded him. The two of them are together. Wounded him. It says, then King Joram went back to Jezreel, which is where he lives up north, to recover from the wounds with the Syrians had inflicted on him at Ramah when he fought against Haziel, king of Syria. And Ahazia, king down north, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. King down south is going up to see the king up north. They fought against the king of Syria, and they should not have. God told them not to do it. But this wasn't during a time when the kings were listening to God. So, of course, they get... And sometimes God tells you, don't do something. Well, why, why not? Because I know you're going to get wounded and, and you're going to die. I'm trying to warn you, but we don't listen. We think, I don't know why God's telling me not to do that. Oh, that's why. Sometimes I ignore the GPS on my car. I always go this way to get to the forum. 
why is, why is it telling me to go the other route? And then you take the wrong route and you go, oh, I did, okay, now I'm going to be stuck in traffic for 30 minutes. So sometimes we don't know why we're being rerouted by God in a different way. So it says, Ahaziah, the son of Joram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab and Jezreel, because he was sick. I'm skipping to 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, and Elijah the prophet called one of the sons of the prophet and said to him, Get yourself ready, take this flask of oil in your hands, and go to Ramoth Gilead. That is where Joram is. He's up north. Now when you arrive at that place, look there for Yehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him rise up from among his associates and take him to an inner room. Because God's needing to replace both these kings. The son of Aham, Joram, he needs to be replaced. Ahaziah, the son-in-law, needs to be replaced. They both need to be replaced. They're both really evil kings. They're doing the same things that Ahab does. So he's saying, I'm going to basically, I'm going to, we're going to have a new king. Yeah, he's going to be a new king. He says, then take, this is 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 3, then take the flask of oil, pour it on his head, and say, thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Now there's more to it, but the writer only put that small snippet. He, he puts the rest of it later. He says, then open the door and flee and do not delay. Get out of there. Why? Because God is drama. He, he wants him to walk in, anoint him, you're the new king. And then he's out. And on that note, I'm out. And so, and just leave so that they have to deal with it. Wow. What was that? I don't want this to be turned into a question and answer period. Well, how long is he going to be king? And, how you, and why'd you pick him instead of him? Just announce it and leave. Open the door and flee, and do not delay. Okay, so in verse 6 it says, Then he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and he said to him, so here's the whole prophecy, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord and over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. Because Ahab was just killing hundreds of prophets, just and, and Jezebel, just lining them up. Tried to kill Elisha, but Elisha won. But um, you're going to strike down the house of Ahab, which means in both places, in the north and in the south. Because in the south, he's a son-in-law of Ahab. Up north, he's the actual son of Ahab. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, you, you got an assignment. Second Kings chapter 9, verse 22, a little farther down. Now it happened, so Yehu um, <laughs> goes up north, he's riding his horse, and you can see him in the distance from the top of the castle, and he's riding, and uh, Joram sees him, and, well, it's, uh, a watcher, they call him a watcher, comes and says, hey, guess who's, Jehu's coming. He says, well, ask him if it's peace. Send a servant out there and say, do you come in peace? And so the servant goes out there, Ask him if you're coming peace. Jehu says, uh, no. But if you want peace, join on my side. And the servant never comes back. So the watcher says, well, let me tell you what I saw. I sent the guy out there, says, do you come, go in peace? He didn't come back. Send another guy out there and find out, do you come in peace? Are you coming in peace? So he sent the second guy out there. Same conversation happens. Second guy doesn't come back. He just stays on Jehu's side. So, Verse 22, now it happened when Joram saw Jehu, like, Yehu, like, let me go up and see this person, that he said, is it peace, Yehu? Which is kind of a dumb question. You know, I, you said two people, and they haven't come back. So he answered, what peace, as long as the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many? Like, no, you're doing the same thing that your mother Jezebel did, and that your father Ahab did, so no. So then Joram turned around and fled. So, I mean, he rides his horse all the way out to him by himself. Because I sent two servants, and I don't know why they didn't come back. Yes, you do. You know I didn't come back. So, so now he's turning around on his horse. He's fleeing, and he said to Ahaziah, treachery, Ahaziah. So don't forget, Ahaziah is up there with him, right? And they both had run, run out there. So the king of the south and the king of the north, they're both there together. Hey, Ahaziah, run. run. Get out of here. Now, Yehu drew his bow with full strength and shot Jehoram between his arms 
and and the arrow came out at his heart and sank down and he sank down in his chariot. So he's running away and he shoots him with the arrow. Boom. Right? Gets him. Verse 27. But when Ahaziah, king of Judah, so now we've got the king of up north. He's done for. But when Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the road to Beth Haran. So this is I'm gonna go a different way. I'm not I'm, so I'm not gonna follow him. Uh, so Yehu pursued him because I, I still see you. I see you. There's only three of us out here in this field of battle. So just because you went to the right and said to the left, okay, I'll just pursue you. And he said, shoot him also in the chariot. And they shot him at the ascent of Gur. This is, and if, so, when I actually teach in Second Kings, I'll go through why all these places are significant. But they just shot him at a certain place, which is by Iblim. And then he fled to Megiddo and he, Megiddo. Where is Armageddon? We get that word. That's a place, Megiddo. And he died there. Okay, so we've taken care of the king of the south, north, right? The king of the north and the king of the south, we think. But remember, I told you that this is all about Athaliah. It's about the mother-in-law. So 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 1 said, Now Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. 70. Because Jezebel was not his only wife. He had many concubines. And like some of our celebrities today, he just thought, my job is just to have a bunch of kids with a bunch of different women. So he had 70 sons. Uh, Joram was the oldest and became king. But there are 70 others who could just take his place. Uh, and, and who he'd raised and who were just going to do the very same thing as Ahab. The problem is they're going to become king and start killing people. God gives them an opportunity to repent, but they're just going to do the same things that their father. That's what J Joram did. He did the same thing that his fathers did, teach, teaching people to work up, worship ba Baal or Baal, uh, other gods, and teach and killing prophets, killing the prophets of God that God's sending to warn people so they can avoid all this trouble. You kill the messengers. So people are going to do crazy stuff. So they have to be eliminated because they're just going to do the same thing. You take away one, the next one's going to come do the same thing. Next one's going to come do the same thing. Next one's going to come do the same thing. So Yehu wrote a letter to Samaria. He sent letters to Samaria to the rulers of Jezreel. This is where all this was happening, right? To the elders. This is where they're originally from. Um, Joram went to Ramoth Gilead to recover but he's from Jezreel. That's where he's from Jezreel. And that's where all the other 70 sons were. And he basically said, you got to kill those sons. They're just going to do the same things. And, and God had pronounced a, uh, a curse on the house of Ahab. Not like a witch's curse. You'll be cursed. But he's saying, these are the, your house is now cursed. You're, because of your actions, Ahab, people are going to come after you. They're going to hate you. They're going to try to kill you. You're doing this to yourself. If you stop now, it won't happen. And of course, Ahab said, ha, how dare you? I'll kill you for even delivering that message, Elijah. Okay, I don't think that's what's going to happen. So, um, so now that God's prophecy is coming true, because God saw it happening. God sees the future. He warns us stuff because he sees it. He lives 20 years from now. He lives 40 years from now. If God's telling you, don't do that or do do that, it's because he knows what's coming up. He's already seen it. Um, so he wrote a second letter to them saying, because he wrote one letter saying, you got to kill those sons. They go, oh, I don't know if you want to kill the son. So he wrote a second letter in verse 6 saying, if you are for me and will obey my voice, understand that I'm, I'm the new king uh, and I'm trying to unite north and south, then come to me at Jezreel by this time tomorrow. And now the king's sons, 70 persons, were with, were with the great men of the city. So he says, I'm on my way there. So either you do it, I'm going to do it. Somebody's going to do it. So now the king's sons, 70 persons, were with the great men of the city who were rearing them. They were at various ages, 12, 14, 20, 30. They were at various ages, just getting ready. Oh, I can't wait to be king so I can just kill some more people. So it was when the letter came to them that they took the king's sons and slaughtered 70 persons and put their heads in baskets and sent them to him at Jezreel. Aww. Here, here you go. Here's a nice gift for you. We've got their heads in nice baskets. There's lovely baskets. So... Here's, uh, so you've got the 70 sons dead of, of Ahab, right? Joram 
and now this his 70 brothers. There's still Athaliah. There's a sister that was not killed. Okay. But also down north, you got Ahazia and his brothers, because they're just going to take over and do what Ahazia was doing. So Yehu met in, in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 13, it says, Yehu met with the brothers of Ahazia, king of Judah, and said, who are you? Now, initially, he's just riding around, and he goes down north, thinking, you know, I'm king now, and he runs into 42 of them. And so they answered, we are the brothers of Ahazia, and we have come down to greet the sons of the king and the sons of the queen mother. We're on our way to meet our 70 uncles so we can learn from them and do the same thing and nah and he said take them alive verse 14 so they took them alive and he killed them at the well of beth echid 42 men and he left none of them so 70 sons the 70 uncles are dead the, the 42 nephews are dead but what about athalia the the sister okay second kings chapter 11 verse 1 so it says, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose and destroyed all the royal heirs. I'm going to kill his kids. So Yehu got the brothers, Ahaziah's brothers. She killed all of Ahaziah's sons, her own grandkids, so that she could be queen, so there'd be no claim to the throne but her. Like, I'll be queen now. Because you know Jezebel was my mom, right? So she was, she was running Ahab. I can run this kingdom. So I'm going to kill all my grandkids because I want to be queen. So she destroyed all the royal heirs. She thought. But Yehoshiba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah. So Joram's his sister, right? So Joram's one daughter took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered. And they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah so that he was not killed. And so she thinks she's gotten them all. I'm going to kill all these kids. And they're just babies, right? Uh, I'm going to kill all of his kids and that way I can reign. So that's truly the Jezebel spirit. I've heard the Jezebel spirit. That's truly the Jezebel spirit. Um, I don't care who dies. I'm going to kill everybody. I need to reign. My reigning is more important than anybody else's life. So he was hidden in, in with her and his nurse, the her is his nurse, in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. For six years, she's reigning down south, even though Yehu supposed to, was, had been anointed king. In the seventh year, Jehoiada, who had hidden this little kid, right? He's living in the temple. She never came to the temple, so she, she did not know because she wasn't about the temple. She's about other gods. She's just doing the same thing Jezebel's doing. You're going to worship Baal, Baal, however you want to say it, B-A-A-L. You're going to worship him. You're going to do what I say to do. Forget the Bible. Forget what God said. We don't care about the Torah. So she never even went to the temple. She doesn't know that her grandson is being raised there for six years. In the seventh year, okay, verse 3 said, so he's hidden in the house, hidden with her, with the nurse, in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned of the Lord, verse 4. In the seventh year, when he's finally seven years old, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of the hundreds, of the bodyguards and the escorts, and he brought them into the house of the Lord to him, to the king, because nobody knows he's there. Uh, the army people certainly don't know he's there, and, and uh, while, uh, while Athaliah is... Italia, maybe, uh, however you want to say her name, she is reigning. No one really goes into the temple because they weren't worshiping God during this whole time. So he, they bring him all there and go, hey, look, she didn't kill everybody. And he made a covenant with them and took an oath from them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Second Kings chapter 11. <sighs> Verse 11. Then the escort stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, all around the king, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, by the altar and the, the house of the temple, right? The, the, the house next to the temple, Solomon's uh, house they built next to the temple, Solomon's porch. They're, they're just spread out. We're going to protect this king. He's the real king in the south. Yehu's king in the north. 
Uh, and he brought out the king's son, verse 12. And he put the crown on him and gave him the testimony, gave him the instructions of how to be king. They made him king and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king! So this hundreds of people in the temple, which no one had been there for years, clapping and long live the king, right? They're all excited. Now when Athaliah heard the noise of the escorts and the people, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. What's going on in this temple that I thought I had closed down? Verse 14, when she looked, there was the king standing by a pillar, according to custom, because that's what you're supposed to do once you're anointed. There's a pillar, a certain pillar you stood by. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. And all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. So Athaliah tore her clothes and cried out, treason, treason. Now, she's the one who usurped it, right? She's the one who had all the heirs killed, but she's standing by the altar, treason, treason, thinking that's going to protect her. And Jehoiada, who's the new priest, the priest, oh, I just read it, verse 15, and Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds and the officers of the army, and they said to them, take her outside under guard, because the last time we killed somebody in the temple was Joab, and you know that's really against the law, but he kind of forced her hand. So take her outside under guard and slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest had said, do not her, do, the priest had said, do not let her be killed in the house of the Lord. Because you're not, the Bible says, don't do it in the house of the Lord. Joab was an exception because he wouldn't leave the altar. But just take her out. Uh, because we're not supposed to kill her. Say that again. So, so, uh, uh, so they took her out, so they seized her, she went by way of the horse's entrance into the king's house, and there she was killed. So she goes into uh, Solomon's temple, uh, house, Solomon's house that he built right next to the, to the, across from the temple, and there she was killed. So, this is how this has played out uh, through the years, if you kill someone on purpose, then that's your punishment, if you're just a murderer, because you did not give life you don't have the right to just appoint yourself god and somebody's executioner and just kill them on the spot we don't like people to do that there must be a trial the person has an opportunity to plead their case and then we pray that god gives the judge wisdom that's what god is setting up uh but it's, it can't be about vengeance like that if you do that then you, you have to be punished so that people know there's punishment for them because if there's no punishment and I, I always make a school reference because I was a school teacher for so long. If the class sees, oh, we've got a new teacher and they don't punish people for goofing her off, then they just go crazy. So, the, so you walk by the classrooms where kids are going crazy and that's because they have no respect for the teacher. You have no way of enforcing. You have no authority. We can do whatever we want. Same kids, different teacher, totally under control because they know that there's consequences. The teachers let them know right away, yeah, there's consequences. So you can take the very same kids and, and think, how come they're so good with that teacher? Because this teacher's let them know there are consequences for reaction. So God's saying, you'll be murdered if you murdered, and that's going to help a lot of people keep themselves under control if they know there are consequences. Doesn't, won't stop everybody, but for the people when they do act up, consequences, and the people go, oh, this person really means what they say. So God says th there must be consequences. However, if it was an accident, if it wasn't premeditated, you get a chance to plead your case. But if you're pleading your case and lying, if you're just going to the altar and going to the temple and saying, oh, I'm innocent, and, but you're not, you don't get to just use this because people will want to pervert the law, always use it to their advantage. How can I pervert that and use, you know, take advantage of that situation? So that person you can kill, just don't do it in my house. So here's the story of Athaliah who thought she can get away with killing all of her grandkids, uh, and, uh, but no. And, and there, there was a six year period, I'm sure people were fretting and oh my God, she's getting away with it. God says, no, the people you think that are getting away with stuff, I know you want immediate, but I'm giving them opportunity to repent. But I can see, you know, so that they can't stand before me. Well, I was gonna repent, really you had six years. You didn't. So in year seven, I made sure the justice happened. So that's the. So now I'm finally done with all the examples of. Uh, but you can't just kill them in the altar, take them outside, kill them. That's part. That's in the law. So, Exodus chapter twenty-one, verse fifteen. Finally moving on after two weeks. 
He who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death. Um, doesn't mean kill them. Just strike them. Because they would, fathers and mothers would fall under the, the law that came before. If you kill somebody, you're put to death. It says he who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death. Really, you can't disrespect your father and mother like that. No. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 16, it says, Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, Amen, Amen. Here's why God is that, that at that time. Now, this doesn't apply if, you're, if you had a parent who was mentally ill and abusive and crazy and was burning you with cigarettes every night and stuff like that. That's not, God's not talking about that rare type of situation that you may have been in. You may have had a parent who couldn't get their life together, but God is saying, I will give that parent wisdom for you. You have to trust. Maybe they don't know what they're doing, them, but they'll say, I think you need to take a coat now, or, I, or you may look at them and go, Psst, you don't know what you're doing. You just lost your job last week. But God wants us to know that he has a hierarchy as far as how he leads and guides us. And as long as you're a child, I'm going to give that parent's guidance for you. I need you to believe that. Uh, even if they couldn't get their own life together, they'll have guidance for you. How do we, what's one way that we know that? Just in the previous chapter, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, the first, the, there are ten commandments. The first five are about our relationship with God. The second five are relationship with each other. The second five, thou shalt not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery. That's how we deal with each other. The first five are about our relationship with God. It's important that we have a certain respect for God and understand who God is. So the, verse 2 of Exodus 20 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. That's who I am. Respect. Remember who I am. So, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Next, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Don't, uh, don't worship another god. Don't, don't believe that those other gods are better than me. And do, first of all, they don't exist. But I know how you are, and you're going to believe in these other things. Don't put those things above me. I know they don't exist, but you're going to think they exist. Don't put them above me. Don't make carbon, graven images so that you aren't even tempted to worship other gods that don't exist. Uh, verse 7, you should not take the name of your God in vain. Don't use me. I promise uh, that I will uh, pay you back or may God strike me down. Don't do that. Don't use me in order to manipulate other people, maneuver other people. Respect. I'm not just somebody you can just, I'm not your servant or somebody you use to get out of situations. I'm God who made you. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Remember this one day of the week where I'm asking you, do not work. This is my day. I'll give you assignments on that day. So it doesn't mean, don't do your own work. If I tell you to work on that day, fine, but un at least give me one day that you are trusting I will take care of your needs, that you're thinking about me first. Now, we've been called to a life of Sabbath where we're supposed to do that every day. So initially, he was calling at least one day. But uh, if you can't give me one day, <laughs> you know, give me seven now. Then the next verse Honor your father, it's five. Honor your father and your mother. Well, how, what does that have to do with the God verses? Expecting God, loving God, not worshiping God. Well, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you because I am going to direct you through them. Mm -hmm. So they're going to say things. They may not even know why they said it. They may not even know why they're just showing up at your school one day. They may not know why, but God just whispered in the ear, why don't you go down and check out that basketball game? Or go down and, you know, and they just show up there. I don't know, I just felt like doing this. Uh, but there was going to be a gang fight that was going to happen. Or there was going to be, you know, or they, your parents said, I don't think you should go to that party. You're mad at them because, I don't know, but you go to that party anyway, and sure enough, there's gunfire. You know, so this is, you've got to believe that I'm directing. If you disrespect them, you're really disrespecting me. Now, again, if your parent was mentally ill, then that does not apply. If you, because it's easy to, you know, well, my, then that doesn't apply. But just assuming that they're the average typical parent, right? 
So he's saying, cursed is the one who treats his father or mother with contempt. Uh, there's, I, I, it, you're going to endanger your life if you do that. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 18 through 21. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, he will not heed them, then his father's mother shall take hold of him, bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city, and they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, so that you shall put away this evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Because we can't have a bunch of rebellious, crazy kids uh, who are not listening to their parents. This is not going to work that you grow up, because if you grow up with disrespecting in that way, then you won't respect pastors, you won't respect ministers, you won't respect bosses, you won't respect the people that I, you won't respect the prophets when I send them. So we have to have a culture. Now, please know in scripture, this never happened. There was such fear in parent and kids' uh, lives of being killed that there's not a record of this happening. That you didn't respect, uh, and they, they brought you and everybody in the whole town killed you. That, that never happened. But God wanted it there as a warning. He wants so that the kids would be scared, you know. And and a lot of cultures have that sort of thing. La Yarona will get you late at night. Oh no! And just whatever they can do to scare you, right? There's a boogeyman in your bed, so go to bed. So kids were scared into. Except God meant this, and but fortunately, it never had to. It never had to happen. Uh, if we had more of this in society, because there are some kids who are sitting in their basements loading up shotguns and. And parents are not going, what are you doing down there? And come out and stop playing with that. Stop shooting animals later. <laughs> you know, there's some kids who parents could have spotted what was wrong. And that's why in our society, we kind of hold parents responsible a lot of times for what their kids are doing. Because God is directing you. You do know. We believe you're shutting your ears and your eyes sometimes to extreme behavior. Some people have crafty kids who hide stuff. But in some cases, we go, so every night he was down there shooting things. You just never went down to the basement for five years? You had no idea? Well, that's on you. If your child's just crazy and ran off and did something, there's nothing, you know. But sometimes you're fostering a, a crazy person, and this is what God's trying to pre prevent. If they're a drunkard, if they're a druggie, if they're, and they're just not listening to the parents, then that's on the child. But if the parent actually just takes no interest in that not no interest in the child but you know is not watching and saying what is going on with you what's happening you're not qu questioning the child because god will give you wisdom even if you don't know what you're doing mm -hmm. he will give you wisdom for the child you have to take the time to deal with him god will help you if you engage <laughs> but you can't let seven years go by and they were in your cellar and then they come up and shut up the school and you had i didn't i didn't know well you should have known so if you had just engaged, I would have given you the wisdom and what to do. Or, I mean, you know, in those situations, there are people who have called the police and please come get my son, he's crazy. And then sometimes, you know, because of laws or whatever, they haven't followed through. But at least the parent did recognize. So we don't hold that parent. You know, we look at the, once a kid has done some crazy thing, we look back at the records and go, oh yeah, that parent came several times and reported. Because they knew, because God told them, uh, Something's going on with your kid. And, the, and now maybe the townspeople didn't know. Maybe the mayor didn't follow up on it or the police chief. But the parent, God will tell you he, if you're listening. And you'll know things that your kids don't know. I don't think you should take that trip. I don't think you should. Oh, man, you're always picking at me. Da, 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 da. But hopefully you've raised a child that will say, okay, I, I really wanted to go, but my parents said no. That they that child will have a long life. Honor your parents and your, your mother and your father. You will have a long life because you listened when you were young and learned to respect authority. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Um, uh, and on Wednesdays, we are in the book of John. It's the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. We're in, in John chapter 12, about to start John chapter 13. And we will continue on from here next week in the book of Exodus. So thank you again very much. Wait, how can I, how do I, oh, there I go. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate that you take your time. Uh, I know what you're referring to, Joshua Shaw. Uh, yes, and if you'd listened to the first, last week I was saying, 
you were referring to how can you value yourself over somebody oh i'm more righteous than you we can't we don't value so that is wrong to say i'm more righteous than you you aren't we all have the exact same righteousness joshua shaw what the person was referring to is he he cut down innocent people he used the word righteous but what he's referring to is that person was innocent and he killed them and, and and so that's what he means by they were more righteous than you he doesn't mean it in the way that we try to use it today but you're not very righteous because we all have equal righteousness we are all the same doesn't matter what we've done once we've been covered by the blood of jesus he just sees us all exactly the same okay i just happened to see joshua's comment all right thank you so much and um i will talk uh, talk to you next week i really appreciate that you take the time to listen in all right bye bye